Welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to be talking about broccoli sprouts and so forth. I need to make the following disclaimer. Nothing in this video should be considered as competent nutritional or medical advice or acted upon without first consulting a medical doctor. Enough said on that. Many people think eating broccoli florets and or sprouts it's good for you because it contains sulforaphane, which is a powerful antioxidant. The truth is that you're ingesting negligible amounts of sulforaphane. You're probably asking, how can I make such a shocking statement that is in direct contradiction to most of the nutritional pundits and YouTube videos? The answer is easy. I just took the time to read Dr. Jed Fahey's paper and also one by Dr. Hansen et al. Hansen found that at 76 degrees Fahrenheit, an endogenous, that is raw, plant pH, nearly all investigated cruciferous plants form nitriles and epithionitriles instead of health promoting isothiocyanates. Let that sink in. Stick with me and I will show you how to overcome this problem and how to prepare broccoli sprouts to actually produce meaningful amounts of sulforaphane. So let's get started. The antioxidant derived from bro broccoli sprouts is sulforaphane, which is an isothiocyanate. However, it is a misconception that broccoli sprouts contain sulforaphane. They do not contain <clears throat> any sulforaphane. Broccoli seeds contain vacuums of glucoraphanin and, and myrosinase. When these plant vacuums are crushed and come in contact with water, a chemical reaction occurs that generates a significant amount of nitriles and very little sulforaphane. The nitriles do not have any antioxidant properties and are not very healthful, healthy to consume. There are epithiospecifier proteins, which I will refer to as ETS, that exist in the broccoli, which favor, significantly favor, nitro formation over sulforaphane. It is the water reacting with the glucoraphanin in the process called hydrolysis that forms the nitriles and sulforaphane. The myriazinase is only a catalyst. <clears throat> The important point is that the predominant byproducts are the nitriles. It is these nitriles that are pungent and that ward off insects. The amount of sulforaphane that is produced by just eating raw florets, sprouts, is minuscule. If you eat steam florets, you will get neither nitriles nor sulforaphane because the steaming destroys all the myrosinase. Most people think that if they grow and consume broccoli sprouts, that they will be consuming a meaningful amount of sulforaphane. That is a broad misconception. I would refer you to Hansen's paper entitled Optimizing Ithocyanate Formation During Enzymatic Glucosionylate Breakdown by Adjusting pH Value, Temperature, and Dilution in Brassica Vegetables, dated 17 January 2017. I'll leave a link of it, <coughs> a link to it in the description below. The formation of health-promoting isothiocyanates is inhibited by ETS proteins present in the sprout. These same proteins promote the production of nitriles and epithionitriles. Hanschen demonstrates that the pH value, temperature, and dilution all affect isothionate formation in raw broccoli florets slash sprouts. <clears throat> Our home solution lies in a modified Fahey process supplemented with Hanschen's improvements. You are probably aware of the blanching process to improve the sulforaphane yields from sprouts. Improving the yield by a factor of 3.5 is quite remarkable. <clears throat> the process raises the temp just enough to destroy some, but not all, of the ETS pro proteins, but not enough to destroy the myronates. It is a good compromise solution, but we can do better. Dr. Fahey <clears throat> address this nitro issue by boiling 72-hour broccoli sprouts for three minutes to destroy all the myrosinase 
and ETS proteins. He then extracted the glucoraphanin from the broccoli sprouts through a complicated process that cannot be done in your kitchen. He then combined the extracted glucoraphanin with myrosinase from daikin roots with water to form sulforaphane. This eliminated or reduced the formation of nitriles because the ETS program proteins were destroyed in the boiling process. We have to remember Dr. Fahey's process was designed to create clinical grade sulforaphane, not a nutritional supplement. So we can proceed in ways Fahey could not. Hansen was further able to determine that when a change in pH to four or eight is made, isothiocyanate formation from an unprocessed crushed sprout increases considerably and nitrile formation decreases. It may be inferred that the pH moderates the adverse effect of the ETS proteins. Normal plant pH is about 5.6. Also, isothiocyanate Thiocyanate formation strongly increases due to dilution, i.e. thorough mixing. So the key information of Hansen's study is that both the pH and dilution are the two most important factors to control. You want as much myrosinase dissolved in water at a pH of 8 coming in contact with the glucoraphanin with the least amounts of ETS proteins present. Additionally, the process can be further enhanced by heating the water at 140 degrees Fahrenheit as the following chart demonstrates. Myrosinase is readily available <clears throat> through other plants like mustard seed powder and daikon roots. The more myrosinase that you have dissolved in pH 8 water coming in contact with the glucoraphanin, the more sulforaphane will be created. To verify that you have active myrosinase, just wet the tip of your finger, place it in the mustard powder, and place it on your tongue. It should burn if you have active myrosinase. Supplementing broccoli sprouts with extra myrosinase is always a good idea. Boiling the sprouts would destroy all proteins present, including the myrosinase and ETS proteins. You will then have to provide all the myrosinase through mustard powder added to the pH water solution used during homogenization. The result is that when the glucoraphanin water and myrosinase come in contact, the pH dilution is there to fully moderate the reaction if any epithiospecifier ETS proteins remain. So how does all this translate into something that the average person can perform in their kitchen? You must transition your mindset from that of a home food preparer to that of a chemist. You must initiate a chemical reaction which must be precisely controlled in order to maximize the amount of sulforaphane while minimizing the amount of nitriles that are produced. So put on your lab coat and let's take a look at this process. Step one, germinate one teaspoon of broccoli seeds in a one half cup canning jar for exactly 48 hours. The seeds are swollen and a few will have started to erupt. Place one quarter cup of boiling water into the canning jar containing the sprouts and let sit for three minutes. This should be enough time to destroy the ETS programs. Then add one quarter cup of room temperature tap water. Check that the resultant temp is less than 140 degrees. If it is too hot, add some more water. If it is greater than 140 F, <clears throat> you will destroy the myrosinase that you will add in the next step. Step two, add one eighth teaspoon of baking soda and one eighth teaspoon of mustard powder to the mixture and pour into a blender containing the sprouts. Step three, blend thoroughly on high speed for two to three minutes. Do not add additional ingredients at this time or you will compromise the process. The results should have the consistency and color of milk with some froth and a slight yellowish tinge from the mustard powder. Let this puree sit for 30 minutes. Fahey incubated for three hours at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Periodically swirl the content, contents. You want to allow enough time for all the glucoraphanin to be converted. So the longer you let it sit, the better the results. Step four, use the resultant mixture as desired. So let's see what this process looks like in practice. Okay, here we are in the, the kitchen and we have uh, one teaspoon of germinated seeds for 48 hours. And what we're going to do is, got a quarter cup of water 
which I'm going to bring to a boil. Okay, here's the uh, one quarter cup of boiling water. I'm going to pour them right onto the seeds. And I'm just going to swirl it around a little bit. And we're going to let that sit for three minutes. Okay, there's our three minutes. I'm going to take my contents. I'm going to pour them into a larger jar that I'm actually going to use. They're actually blending. I'm going to add a little bit more water to it to bring the temperature down because we don't want this temperature to be greater than 140 degrees. And we'll just put a thermometer in there real quick and see what we're getting. And it's well below 140 degrees, so we're perfectly fine there. Next, we're going to take the Coleman's mustard powder. And we're just going to take 1 8 teaspoon and put it in there. And we're going to take some baking powder, 1 8 teaspoon. We're going to put it in there. And then I'm going to put the attachment on it. Okay. And now we're going to couple minutes. Now I'm going to let this sit for 30 minutes and we'll set the timer and we'll come back and check the results. So there you have it, not as daunting as you thought. A brief note on purchasing sulforaphane tablets. Aside from the high price, the problem with tablets is that the sulforaphane is unstable and breaks down easily. Sulforaphane must be stored at minus 20 degrees centigrade, minus 4 Fahrenheit, or below or degradation will occur. If a manufacturer states that a product has a certain level of sulforaphane, that merely means that there was that much sulforaphane at the time the product was made and packaged. What is important is how much sulforaphane remains at the time you consume it. You never know how long it has been since the manufacturer of the product, nor the temperature condition that has been subjected to before arriving on your doorstep. You really have no idea how much sulforaphane you are getting short of testing it. We also do not know if there are trace amounts of harmful chemicals used in the enrichment process or any stabilizers that are used that also may be harmful. The downside of sprouting is that you do not know the glucoraphanin content 
for the seed batch that you have purchased and the potential for unwanted bacterial growth. However, boiling a sprout should reduce the possibility for unwanted bacterial ingestion. All in all, there are a lot of unknowns. However, I think the personal production from seeds is more reliable. Final warning, this has been an academic discussion only and should not be construed as nutritional advice. Don't ingest this stuff unless you know what you're doing and are willing to accept the risk. Thanks for watching.